Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Elder, for reading this passage for us. It's difficult with all the names. Hedonism. What is hedonism? Well, if you see in your uh, outline, in your uh, the sermon outline, uh, the, 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 the words there are actually the um, uh, components of this word, hedonism. It is a pursuit of pleasure and sensual self-indulgence. Pursuit of pleasure and sensual self-indulgence. It's a, a hedonist is a person who doesn't miss out anything in life. Nothing. He will go for every kind of experiences. Every kind of experience. And he wants to see something, he wants it. When he get it, he wants even more. Be it possessions, be it different experiences, be it the best food, he will drive all the way to some place to find the best food. Or sex or fun of any kind. The pursuit of pleasure of any kind. In a sense, and includes sensual self indulgence. What will be the result of hedonism in our, in our uh, modern day? Well, people are like them, actually. People um, uh, actually admire people like this, right? Because hedonists in our era, you are people who are probably the iconic people who have this phrase called they get a life. You know, people will just do something, they don't have a life, then people say, I, I experience everything, come on, let get a life. So people actually admire these hedonists, right? They are deemed as successful people. Probably, like example, the Hollywood stars, they are famous, they are women or men, they have money, a lot of money, and experiences. And a lot of them come with very charismatic personality. For example, I'm going to use some pictures, but of this stuff is very Hollywood star, huh? Hollywood star famous, high, good, uh, very attractive personality. Um, you know who it is? This is not my era. This is not my era. This is Sean Connery. This is not my era. It's a pastor's era. <laughs> my era will probably be something like this. Ah, this guy, handsome, right? Look a bit like me, eh? Okay, ah, <laughs> Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise. Ah, this, that's more closer to our But a newer yeah, generation, probably not these two anymore. The newer generation will be, some, will be like some of the Korean star. Like example, Ong Xiong. <laughs> Who is that? Uh, uh, don't know who is that? Yeah, something like that. These are modern day hedonists. They pursue pleasure and they want it. They want it very much and they will get it. They are people who are admired, they get the life, people admire them. And in our passage today, we have an ancient day hedonist, Esau. And he is famous. It is famous. Take a look at the passage here. Although there are many, many names, take a look at the passage. Verse 1, he said Esau, and that is Edom. Verse 8, what does it say again? Uh, repeats again, Esau is Edom. Verse 9, Esau is the father of Edomites. Verse 19 again, verse 43 again, he says Edom. Esau, that is the father of Edom. You see, again, the whole passage repeats again and again and again, five times, five times. This is a famous guy. It's as if the writer is writing that you don't know who that is. You don't know Sean Connery. Come on, get a life. Look at this. He's so famous that like, he set up an empire for himself. Just like today, when you think of Apple, who do you think of? Who? Apple. You think of this person, right? Oh, sorry, like this Isaac Newton. Yeah, Apple also dropped this here. Okay, but this one. Correct. Okay. Uh, you think of Steve Jobs, isn't it? Of course you think of him. He, he, he made a name for himself, right? You think of Apple products, or iPhone, iPad, whatever. It's Steve Jobs. So in that era, when they think of a powerful kingdom, who, they, who do they think of? Esau is Edom. Can you see? Esau is Edom. Esau is Edom. He's an iconic figure of success, a person who get a life with great personality. Take a look at it. See, see what did he achieve? Verse 1 to 5. Esau took wives for himself. He took wives for himself. And how many wives did he get for himself? Take a look at the passage. You read carefully. Five. I mean, four. Within this passage. Ada is a Hittite. He a Hittite. Or Horibama is a Hittite also. He fights. Actually, he's a Horite. He fights a Horite. Base man. He fights. 
T times. Uh, sorry, my name over. And this uh, basement is most likely the sister of Ada because they are the same father, Elon. This is chapter 26. Okay, and there is this uh, daughter of Ishmael, or Ishmael's daughter, who is not named here, but in chapter 28, you know this is Mahalan. And one more dog, one more wife, which is Judith, which is not mentioned here, but it's earlier, it's mentioned in chapter 26, verse 34. So he has, but he's not mentioned here, but probably Judith doesn't bore him any signs. So that's why he's not, he's not named here. But these are the five women in his life, five wives. You just imagine now, throw your, man, your imagination out and imagine this is a suave, rugged guy. Remember chapter 35 telling that Esau is a skillful hunter, man of the field, out there and the sun is like those tall, dark and handsome guy. Just like tall, dark and handsome. Think of one person, come on. Of course, it's Chester. Who else can it be? He just got married yesterday, so he must be Chester. Yeah. <coughs> he's tall, dark, and handsome yesterday with his aunt with an uh, Air Force uniform, with a sword beside him. Wow. Tall, dark, and handsome. So, you think of him. This is Esau. Esau. Tall. But after yesterday, today, he no more. No more. Not that handsome anymore. Okay. Yeah, and he comes with a great personality. Great personality. You know, and he's big hearted. His brother came to him. Jacob came to him. He forgave his brother. He says, it's okay. It's okay. By God, it's by God. He just hugged his brother and kissed his brother. Remember that chapter? The previous one? And even in this chapter, verse 6, take a look at it. When the land is too small for them, what did he do? He moved out. He didn't fight with his brother. He didn't quarrel with his brother. He's like those nice neighbor, you know, the kind of neighbor that you have that you put your flower pot into his, uh, into his, uh, 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 his corridor. He'll be like, ah, it's okay, la, it's okay. He's a person who cannot stand durian, but when you eat durian and the smell go to his house, he's like, it's okay, he will go out to the park and go for a walk. You know, that kind of nice guy, he's a nice guy, great personality, attractive, surrounded by women, five wives, you know, and he took wives for himself. He never denied of himself of any woman. And some of these wives are probably very beautiful also, you know, because some of the names I say suggested that. Never denied himself of sexual pleasure. Esau is Edom. And he is a hedonist. Hedonism really means the pursuit of pleasure and sensual self indulgence. The pursuit of pleasure and sensual self indulgence. He never denied himself of anything. The kind of person who is admired by probably people of his generation. <coughs> some of us may be thinking over here. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. Didn't Abraham also have a few wives? And Jacob also have a few wives? Same one. Oh, that, that's a difference. That's a, that's a difference. The difference is that Abraham, when he had Hagar, it's not that like he was looking for a woman. Remember? He was looking for a son. So they are using this method, Hagar, to have a son. So he wasn't really looking for a woman. More to look for more women in his life. It was a wrong method, definitely. But he wasn't looking for a woman. So it's a different, uh, there's a difference here. Jacob's the same. You remember, he has, he has four wives. But Leah, he was bluffed into marrying Leah, the older sister. Remember that? And the two servant girls, they were also his methods of getting more children, which is a wrong method, definitely, but it's different from womanizing. Different. But Esau here, in every, in the three chapters, verse 20, chapter 26, 28, and over here, 26. Each time we talk about Esau having wives, he took wives for himself. Yes, he took, verse 2, he said he took these wives from Canaanites, from the Hivites, Hittites, and uh, from the, the Shemalites, uh, Ishmaelites. So he, he, is, he is a Hedonist. He never denied himself of any pleasure. And he's not just surrounded by women, actually. Take a look at verse 6 to verse 8. He is rich. He's rich. He has a lot of money. You know, he's, how rich is he? Take a look at the verse. He has livestock, the cattle, and he has large property. Verse 6 tells you that. And he's so large, verse 7, until he and Jacob, his brother, cannot contain within the same piece of land. You know, and where did he go? He went to Mount Seir. Verse 8 tells us, and he went to occupy the hill country of Mount Seir. And 
This is the first repetition in verse 8 about Esau. It says, so Esau sat there and who? It said Esau is Edom. Esau is Edom. Wow. He's the iconic figure of success, person who get a life, actually. If he's a modern Esau, what would he be look like? It shows up show some picture. He will be staying in these kind of houses. Wow, big house with swimming pool, he suka suka and he jump inside the swimming pool. So he'll be like that. What else will he be like? He'll be driving a car, but not just a normal car. It'll be something like this. Ah, oh, this is like Esau. He will probably have a big company like this. Can you see? Edom Labs. Ah, don't play play, ah, got his name there, okay, Edom Labs. And he will probably appear in some kind of finance and uh, uh, business magazine. You know, he'll be interviewed and all this, like this. Can you see? Edom Labs there. Ah, I have a card in place on the But he will probably look like that, suave, looking, young, uh, not that young, but he will look handsome guy. He's, he's, he's all. He's Edom. He's a hedonist. Never deny himself of any experiences. Never. That is not all about Esau, actually. He made a name for himself, verse 9 to verse 43. He made a name for himself. Can you see? And I, I, in your uh, you know, outline, can you see, I, I purposely arrange it in an ascending order. You know, there was a progression from verse 9 to verse 43. And it's the upward progression. Upward progression. Take a look at it, verse 9 to verse 14. Give you a whole list of Esau's sons and grandsons. He has five sons and ten grandsons and other daughters as well, which is not mentioned. So what do you call that? I put that fruit fruit. He's very fruit fruit. Five sons, ten grandsons. He's fruit fruit. Verse 15, verse 19. More than that, he began to call some of these sons as chiefs. Chiefs. That means they are forming clans. You don't let two children and say, like this, I'm a chief. You don't. You have you need a clan behind you to call a chief. So he is a chief. Okay, so I what do you call this? I put that as successful. Can you see he's, a, he's not just fruitful, he's successful, he's successful. And verse 19 tells us Esau is Edom, the father of Edomites. Hedonism. He made a name for himself, right? From verse 20 to verse 30, there's a, we begin to talk about the tribes, the original tribe, the natives of Mount Seir, the Horites. And there's a whole list of names there again, and some chief. But the key verse, take a look at that in verse 25. Look at verse 25, there's one name there, a woman's name, verse 25. Oholibama. Esau's wife. It's not Obama. It's holier than Obama. That's why it's Oh, holy Obama. <laughs> no, whatever. Otherwise, it's a woman. It's a woman. Okay. She, whatever is important here is, is verse 25 says that this holy Obama is the wife of this native chief. I mean, it's not the wife. The granddaughter, the great great granddaughter of this native chief, Seer. And Esau married her. Verse 2. You can see first to tell him he married this for Holy Baba. He married the correct family. In fact, after marrying these native people, he took over the mount, he took over the whole entire uh, territory, Mount Seir. And the scripture actually tells us that he took over by force. How do you know that? Let me show you a verse. You don't really have to turn to it in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 12. You can put out a reference. Chapter 2, verse 12, it says the Horites, which is here, the Horites. Also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place. Can you see? He married into their family, established himself, after that he took over the whole entire uh, uh, territory by force. By force. What do you call this? Powerful. He has his own clan, he's become successful. Now he is powerful. He took over the whole entire mouse here. Esau is Edom. Never, never deny himself of any pleasure, any experience. Verse 31 to 39, there's a list of kings over there. List of kings. Suddenly there's this list of kings who are ruling over the land of Edom. 
who are these people? Well, we don't really know how they come about, but the key verse is verse 31. Verse 31 tells you, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom. And the key phrase is here, before any king reigned over the Israelites. Oh no, Israelites were still a small kuchikura, I mean small fly in the area. How many people? Small. Just Jacob and his family. Now there are list of kings in, among the Edomites. They are way before, way before, way ahead of the Israelites, his brother. What do you call this? The Avans. They are much more advanced than Jacob himself. Can you see? And the conclusion of this chapter, verse 40 to verse 43, the conclusion is that whole list of chiefs again, and these are chiefs under Esau, the father of Edomite, verse 43. And you read verse 43 carefully, he says this, uh, these are chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of Edomite. He's actually writing to you that, that's Edom. Don't you know who that is? He is Esau. He's a father of Edomite. He is, I put that, he is epic. He is epic. He is, no one is in generation is equal to him. Wow. Can you see the kind of progression that he has and it's an upward progression? Esau is an icon of success. He's a person who has a life. He has everything. He's fruitful. He's successful. He's influential to the whole entire generation, his whole entire area, and he's at the peak of his generation. He's like Steve Jobs. In our generation, we talk about Apple products. He, he, he never denied himself of any experience, pleasure, or desire. He's a go-getter, and he's a high achiever. That's the end of this chapter. We ask ourselves this question, what is this about? Why did Moses include this chapter in the whole Genesis? It's not about Jacob. Why did Moses write this? One possibility is so that when you have your sons, you don't know how to name them. You do to this chapter, you... Mm, okay, and your daughter or holy mama. Yes. No, one possibility, but of course not. Why do you think this chapter is included in Genesis? Why do you think the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write this chapter? Well, you need, this chapter cannot be read by itself. You must, be, you must take one step back to look at it and careful um, arrangement of this chapter. Before this chapter came, this chapter is like a sandwich. You know a sandwich? There's a top bread and there's bottom bread. There's a top bread. It begins with a list of descendants of Jacob. Chapter 35, verse 23 to 26. These are, these are the children of Jacob. Then, the, chapter 36 comes. Who descended of Esau? In the bottom bread is chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob again. Jacob lived in the land of his father, sojourning in the land of Canaan. So it's about Jacob, Esau, Jacob again. So what is this doing here? It is doing a contrast, a big contrast between two lists of descendants. It's about Jacob contrasting and comparing Jacob and Esau. And Moses keep, if you remember, Moses keep very, very close records of genealogies in Genesis. Now, this is not the first list of genealogies actually. Remember in chapter 5, chapter 4, actually starting with chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 11, 10, 11, uh, and all the way there, there are a lot of genealogies and I put it up in your outline. Can you see the genealogies? Moses is trying to trace these two different lines, the godly line, and the godless line. The godly line and the godless line. The seed of the woman, remember in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman will be against the seed of the serpent. Can you see? There are always these two lines that are in, and I show you here in the picture. There are two lines, can you see? A bit small. Okay. <clears throat> the offspring of the woman versus the offspring of the serpent which is the godly line versus the godless line. So Seth and Cain, then after that, there's a whole list of their descendants, Shem and Ham, and after Japheth, but there's a whole list of descendants there, then Abraham, and a whole list of descendants to Abraham. After Abraham, Isaac, 
Ishmael, the holiest of Ishmael, the, the genealogies, Isaac to Jacob, and now Jacob versus Esau, and the whole list of Esau's genealogies. What is Moses doing here? He's trying to contrast two lines, two people, two companies, two types of people here on earth. You see, when God put here from heaven into earth, he only see two types of people. His people, the godly line, or his enemy, the godless line. There are two types of people. And now here he's comparing these two. How do we compare them? Jacob and Esau. Jacob, small company of people. Yeah, he has a clan, but very small. Twelve sons and four wives. And compared, the best part is it didn't even happen in his lifetime. Remember Jacob died at Genesis chapter 49, 50? He died there. He didn't even see the possession of the land. And how many people did he have when he go down? Did he, did he have when he go down to uh, Egypt? 70 people. That's all. That's his, that's the biggest that he has. That's his kind. Esau, remember in earlier chapter? When Esau, in chapter 32 and 33, when Esau came and met Jacob, he had already 400 soldiers with him. Whoa, he had already had men, 400 men, that's why he's, Jacob was so scared. Remember the earlier chapter? Look, this guy already so powerful, he had already 400 soldiers with him. What can we learn from here? Lesson number one. God's people don't always get to see the immediate fulfillment of God's kingdom. God's people don't always get to see the immediate fulfillment of God's kingdom. We don't. The church of God, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, is waiting for the kingdom of God to come, for Jesus to return again, right? And we waited. We waited for a long time. And what do we see here on earth? Evil. A lot of evil. Lots and lots of evil, oppression, sin, corruption. We see all these evil around the world. We say, Lord, when are you going to come back? We are still waiting. While waiting, what happened? The gospel get corrupted so along the way in church history. False teaching always creep into the church and destroy the church. While waiting, what happened? The church turned worldly. The leaders of the church struggle for power, play politics. The church get corrupted again. What happened? But other than that, other parts of the world, the church get persecuted very badly. A nice person doesn't go to heaven. A good person doesn't go to heaven. Remember that. A good person doesn't go to heaven. 